In this video, we're going to be taking a look at this lens here. This is a Nikon 24-200 f4-6.3. to This is Nikon's first full-frame Z-mount lens that's not an S-line lens. But I'm not just going to be sitting here telling you about why I bought it and what some of the tech specs are. I'm going to be doing the most important thing, which is heading out onto the location to capture some real-world landscape photographs with it. Right, before we head out on location to capture some landscape photographs, let's talk about some of the technical aspects of this lens. Now, as I said at the beginning of this video, this is Nikon's first lens for the Z-mount, first full-frame lens for the Z-mount that's not an S-line lens. But what is an S-line lens? Well, basically put, it's Nikon's kind of superior line of lenses. So you can expect the absolute best quality that Nikon can offer. So you'll get things like minimal focus breathing, you'll get nano crystal coatings, and generally speaking, they're designed for high resolution cameras. So you can expect the absolute best image quality, and you can also expect the image to be sharp all the way out to the corners. But this is not an S-line lens. So what are you missing out on? What are some of the differences? I own two S-line lenses. I own the 14 to 30 f4 and the 24 to 70 f4. Now, this lens, being a non-S-line lens, does differ slightly. First of all, it wouldn't have those nano crystal coatings. And second of all, it's actually a variable aperture lens. So my S-line lenses are both all constant at f4, but this goes from f4 to 6.3 but this isn't necessarily a deal breaker for me. It might be for some people, depending on the things that you shoot. But for landscapes, I'm often going from f8 down to f11 down to f13. So the variable aperture aspect of it doesn't really matter to me. Couple of cosmetic things though, this actually has a lock switch. So for the zoom barrel and the S-line lenses, you just close it and it clicks in. This one actually has a physical switch to stop that coming out. But I've never had a problem with the, the zoom coming out on its own. So I'm not gonna be too worried about that. One thing that it is missing that I think I might miss is the AF-MF switch. So this would allow you to switch it from automatic focus to manual focus on the barrel of the lens. To do that on this lens, you have to go into the camera and change the setting. And one last sort of cosmetic thing, obviously it doesn't have an S-line badge, but the text here is actually printed rather than sort of engraved or boss. So maybe just a slight, I can not, not reduction in quality, but just to kind of differentiate you between uh, an S-line lens and a non-S-line lens. But I still expect this lens to perform really well. I bought this lens for a number of reasons. So the size, weight, versatility, and focal length. Let's talk about focal length first. So currently I have a gap in the focal lengths that I like to use. My 24-70 only, obviously only goes up to 70 millimeters. And I sometimes I miss the kind of having that 70-200 f2.8 that I had in the old F-mount system gave me a longer reach, which is quite good for doing certain types of landscape photographs and sometimes useful for doing panoramic images. Now, there is a 70-200-2.8 for the Z-mount lens, but I no longer have a requirement to have a 2.8 lens, plus the cost of that lens, well, it's not within my budget. I, I can't justify the cost of that lens. And unfortunately, there's no F4 version on the horizons. There's nothing in the, the roadmap. The roadmap's still quite limited. So to cover that kind of reach over and above 70 millimeters, that's why I've gone for this 24 to 200. So even though it covers uh, the 24 to 70 that I've already got, I'm really looking to use it over and above the 70 millimeter range. And the other reason that I bought this lens is because of its size, weight, and versatility. And why it's gonna be a good lens is it's for those times when I only wanna take one lens out. So for example, I wanna go hell walking and I wanna really reduce the amount of gear that I take being able to take one lens out that covers a focal length of 24 to 200 millimeters is gonna be really useful. It's kind of small, it's lightweight, so it's not gonna weigh down my bag too much, plus I'm not gonna to have to change lenses out in the field. Now, it's not gonna replace my 24 to 70, but it could be a good option for when I wanna be out in the field uh, with a lighter kit bag. It very much reminds me of the first lens I bought for the first Nikon digital SLR that I bought, which is a Nikon D80. I bought the 18 to 200 and I got great use out of that lens as well. So I'm hoping to do exactly the same for this one. I expect to get a good few years of use out of this lens and, and hopefully I'm not gonna miss any of those S-line specific features in it. But I will be keeping an eye on the roadmap for Z-mount lenses. There's a couple of interesting items in there. There's a 24 to 105 S-line and a 100 to 400 
S line. Now, no indication of dates or whether these will be F28s or F4s, but they could present an interesting option if I coupled them with my 14 to 30 and got rid of my 24 to 20 and my 24 to 70. That way I'd have focal lengths covering everything all the way from very wide at 14 to quite tight telephoto at 400. I can't see myself ever needing any additional um, focal lengths after that. But who knows when those lenses are coming out? Who knows if they're even going to be affordable or whether they're going to be big or small? So it's just all conjecture. But it is a constantly evolving landscape when it comes to Z-mount lenses. Right, that's enough technical chit-chat. I've had enough of being indoors. It's time to put this lens on my Z7 and head out on location to capture some photographs. No better way, no better test of a lens, and that's to actually go out on location and capture some landscape photographs. Good morning and welcome to Dartmoor. Let's capture some landscape images with a 24 to 200. Okay, believe it or not, this is actually my third time trying to shoot this particular segment of the video. Uh, first two times was up in Rip and Tor. Uh, the time before this one, it was, uh, I did manage to do some talking to camera, but because it was so windy, it was mostly just me shouting at the camera. So I didn't get much time to talk about photography or using the lens, though both trips did yield some good pictures and I will talk about those when we get back home. But I thought I'd come out again this morning to a slightly different location uh, and try and capture some more photographs. Perhaps I'll have more opportunity to uh, talk about the composition and the use of the lens. Certainly it's a lot calmer uh, this morning, so I think filming will be a lot easier. But why don't we make a start, get the camera out and uh, start picking out some compositions. Okay, for my first composition, this is one I discovered just the other day. Actually, I was up here filming another video and it was kind of like my first time up at this location and I was really excited um, about discovering it and finding all these compositions. So I thought I'd come back and reshoot this one for this particular video. So it's a really nice composition. I'm quite lucky. I've still got some of the heather here in the foreground. It's still nice and purple. Now I've got these two tours sitting out here and then over in the distance there, I've got places like Haytor and I've got the rising sun, which is just what I'm waiting for. It's just now starting to peak above the horizon. I think I'm gonna have everything in place to take the shot. I'm using a graduated filter to help control the brightness in the sky. And I'm hoping once that sun just starts to peak above that horizon, I'm gonna get some nice light on the foreground. I've spotted a bit of dew on the ground as well, so maybe that might catch the light. So actually, here comes the sun now. Better take that picture. Well, one of the things for sure, landscape photography is not easy. So while I definitely have much calmer conditions today, the lack of any sort of cloud in the sky is uh, proven to be a bit more of a challenge than I hoped it was gonna be. So while I did get the shot over there, um, just the kind of lack of cloud didn't really diffuse the sun that much. I didn't get the, the light I quite wanted on the ground, but I still, still got a shot and uh, it was good to put the, the lens to good use. But I've flipped over the hill, so now I've got the sun behind me and I've got this nice view here. I've got this uh, clump of heather, leads out to a couple of rocks and out into the distant view there, which looks absolutely spectacular in the morning light. It's just starting to come across the hills and the fields over there. So I put the camera in the vertical orientation because I want to try and get as much of this heather in as possible. And I'm also, uh, I'd never be scared to put the ISO up a little bit. So I've got to, I think about four or 500 at the moment. This is to give me a, a faster shutter speed. Because even though there's a gentle breeze, that heather's just moving a little bit and I want to try and freeze it. I don't want to get any blur if I can possibly help it. And I'm still using the graduated filter there on that rather blue sky. But I think it's a nice scene and uh, one worth taking. Right, the sun is well and truly up now and it's really bright. There's no cloud to diffuse any of the light. So things are getting quite harsh, but 
before I head off, I'm just going to do one more thing. I'm going to try and use the lens at some of its slightly longer focal lengths. So in this shot, I'm actually going to do a panoramic image. It's not going to be great because there's no cloud in the sky, uh, but I wanted to come up here anyway and take the shot because this is something I want to come back maybe in the winter when there's a bit more mist. I think it's going to make a good shot. But anyway, a good chance to put the lens to a uh, good use. I'm probably going to shoot this about f8, shoot a number of images. I've got my panoramic head on, so uh, everything's going to be nice and level. And then once I've taken that, I think I'll take a couple of maybe just some tight shots of the church down there or maybe the hills just to see how things look there. Okay, with a panoramic image shot, I think it's just about time to uh, pack up and go. I'm just going to take some sort of long lens landscape shots at the moment. Again, nothing going to be spectacular, but useful to try the lens out at its longer focal lengths in addition to doing the, the panoramic image. But so far, it's been performing quite well. Looking at the back of the screen and some of the images that I took the other day, they're looking pretty good. I have noticed a couple of things, maybe compared with the 24 to 70, but I'll go home and I'll show you those. And also, I'm going to do the most important bit, which is print some images. It's all very well pixel peeping at three to one, uh, looking for things, but what's important to me is how the image looks when it's printed out. Um, but, you know, it's been a beautiful morning up here, you know, and it's, it's definitely getting colder. I can uh, feel the chill, in the, the chill in the air. But what a better way to start the day than to watch a sunrise on Dartmoor. Absolutely magic. I'll see you back there. Hello again. So before we jump in and look at the photographs that I captured with this lens, um, if you are enjoying this video, please do consider hitting that like button, maybe giving the video a share. And of course, please do leave me a comment. I'd be really interested to hear your thoughts on this lens. I do try and read and reply to everyone's comments. And if you do want to see more content from myself, please also consider hitting that subscribe button. And if you do, or if you're already a subscriber, remember to click on that little bell icon that way you'll receive a notification as soon as I post up a new video. But let's have a look at these photographs. Right, let's take a look at these photographs in Lightroom. But I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time in this. Um, I'm not much of a pixel people. I don't spend a lot of time looking at my images at two to one or even three to one. I look at them on the screen or I make prints. And that's how everyone else views my images. No one else actually views them at two to one or three to one. So as long as the overall quality is suitable, that's all I'm really interested in. And even if I was to show you three to one magnification, if you're watching this on YouTube, you're probably watching it on a mobile phone. You're just not going to see the level of detail that I see from my computer monitor. But I've got a, hopefully a nice selection of photographs to show you. I've already made some prints as well, so I'll show you those later as well. But why don't we jump into Lightroom and have a closer look? Okay, here are the photographs that we're going to have a look at. You'll notice that a couple of them are exactly the same. Uh, this is because I've actually got some side-by-side -side comparison shots with the 24 to 70 as well. Um, so we'll have a look at those side by side and we'll have a look at maybe some of the differences in the image quality between those that were shot with the 24 to 200 and those that were shot with the 24 to 70. So we'll have a look at this first image. It's just taken on the top of Rip and Tor. Uh, perfectly fine. Adds some actually quite nice light for a change, uh, which, which makes for a pleasant surprise up in Rip and Tor. Now, the first thing I will point out is there is a bit of lens flare here. This seemed to be uh, a bit of a, well, not a problem for the lens, but it didn't seem to handle it particularly well when you're shooting directly into the sun. I noticed it on a few of the images and I will be able to do that side by side comparison with the 2470, which I'll show you in a minute to show you how the difference in the, the way those lenses handled that flare. But overall, absolutely fine. The image is perfectly sharp all the way around or acceptably sharp, as you should say, uh, and it looks absolutely fine. Forgot to say that all the photographs that I took with this 24 to 200 were all shot with my Nikon Z7. Next image I've got here, another one from the, the top of Ripperton Tor. Again, everything's looking sharp, all the distant hay tour there, all the foreground rocks. You can see the settings I've used up here. So this was shot at F13, ISO 64. Everything looks pretty sharp. Nice little bit of light there on the rocks. Now, I just wanted to chuck this image in of the mushrooms as a bit of a, a bit of a random one. Now, I, I'm a landscape photographer. I'm not much of a close-up photographer, but I just wanted to show you that at 200 mils, you can actually get some reasonably decent macro shots and you can 
blur out the background. So it would be quite handy for, for subjects like that. I also own a Nessie close-up filter kit as well. So I'll be taking that out and I'll attach that to my uh, 72, uh, sorry, 24 to 200. So for me, it's gonna give me a bit of versatility. So if I do need to actually get a quick macro shot, um, that lens could be proved quite useful with or without um, the Nessie close-up filter. But here we can see the mushrooms there. We can see all the, the backgrounds being blowed out. So just a sort of quick test shot to uh, spot those in the ground. I thought I'd take a, take a shot. Got another shot from the sunrise at Ripon Tor. Again, all the areas being sharp where they need to be. We'll go over here. Again, shot this one shot at f11. So quite harsh lighting conditions, but it's all turned out quite well. This is the first set of images where I've got side-by-side -side comparisons when I took one with a 24 to 70 and another one with a 24 to 200, both shot, I think, at 24 millimeters. This image here, this is the 24 to 70 version, and this here is the 24 to 200 version. If I put them up side by side, and I go through the image, you can see in terms of sharpness, it's a little bit more blur in this one. I must have had a gust of wind there on the 24, but that's nothing to do with the lens, that's just to do with the conditions. So if I look through, Everything is um, exactly the same. Both these images were processed in exactly the same way. Now, if I zoom into this bit here, this is the bit that um, I guess gives is the thing I noticed most about the differences between the 24 to 200 and the 24 to 70. The 24 to 200 is definitely susceptible to more lens flare or, or flare from if you're shooting directly into the sun. It happened a number of times on the foot uh, of the photographs that I was taking, and that's why I wanted to take this side by side comparison with the 24 to 70. This is exactly the same shot, taken probably within 10 15 seconds of each other, and you can clearly see that the version uh, that was taken with the 24 to 70 has none of that flare. Now, this will be to do with the nano coatings and all the other coatings that go onto those S line lenses. So, there is for me, this is the biggest difference I think between the S-line lens and the non-S-line lens is this how the lens handles flare. Now I don't shoot into the sun a huge amount. I'm not expecting this to, to be prove a, a significant problem for me uh, over an extended period of time. I'm certainly not gonna get rid of the 24 to, to 70, um, but I thought it was definitely worth pointing out because um, I did notice it. But other than that, the shots are exactly the same. I mean, I wouldn't be able to tell which one was which. So this is one of the images you saw me capture uh, out in the field just a few minutes ago. Again, you can see a little bit of lens flare coming out here because I'm shooting directly into the sun. But other than that, the image is sharp everywhere I need it to be. There is a little bit of noise in this image, not too much. I mean, I did shoot at ISO 400 just to kind of uh, give me a shorter to shutter speed. Um, but overall, the image quality uh, is excellent. I've got some of the other ones I shot up in that location as well. Pretty similar. Again, it's sharp everywhere I need it to be. You can even see my car down there. And here's another side-by-side -side comparison I'm going to do between the 24 70 and the 24 to 200. So I'll put these up together. So we have the 24 to 70 on the right this time and the 24 to 200 on the left. And the images look pretty well exactly the same. I'd be hard pushed to tell which one was which, particularly because I'm not shooting into the sun, so there's no lens flare this time. If I zoom in there, you can see the photographs look almost exactly the same. There's no difference in quality there. These were all shot at f13. So overall, they, they look exactly the same. I think you, you can only really tell the difference when shooting landscape images is when you're shooting into the sun and the way that 24 to 7 handles that lens flare. The next image I'm going to show you is this panoramic image. This was all shot at 83 millimeters, so this would have been a whole number of shots, probably about eight or nine. But if I look through there, everything is as sharp as can be. This is shot at f8. I can see right down into the village of Widdicombe there. I can see the gravestones. So overall, I'm really happy with that panoramic image. This is one of the reasons I got this lens is it's actually long focal length to take me past that 70 millimeters. So talking of long focal lengths, I'll show you this other image. This is the one, um, this is shot at 200 millimeters. We'll have a look at the detail. Again, shot at F8, bags of detail. You can see all the gravestones, all the bits of the tree, 
electrical cables, cars. Overall, really happy with the image quality of those two photographs. So there we have it. That's all the photographs I'm gonna share with you. Hopefully it's given you an idea um, of the quality of the lens. I know it's really difficult because you are watching this on a YouTube video, so you can't really appreciate the quality of um, you know, YouTube compression and depending on what screen that you happen to be watching it on. But I could, can't tell the difference between uh, the 24 to 70 and the 24 to 200 shots. They're almost exactly the same. And if you just show me um, a picture, one of these photographs on the screen or a print, I wouldn't be able to tell you that it had been shot with a 24 200 rather than 24 70. The only, the only time that I've noticed uh, a real change is when you're shooting directly into the light and you've got lens flare. That 24 to 70, because of its uh, nano coatings, really handles that a lot better. That is quite enough pixel peeping in Lightroom, I think. Let's have a look at some of the prints that I've made. For me, having a print, that's how I want people to view my images. It's how I prefer to view my images. It's a much more natural viewing experience. So as long as, for me, that the image that I capture in the camera with that particular lens then translates into a good print, that's all I'm ultimately uh, caring about. So the first one I've got here is a scene of Rip and Tall, lovely morning lights catching the ground and on the grasses. I've printed it out here on some Photospeed PF Gloss 270 paper and it looks absolutely fantastic. This is the 24 to 70 version and the reason I know it's the 24 to 70 version is because the 24 to 200 has that lens flare on it as well. But other than that, if you put these images side by side, I guarantee you, you will not be able to tell the difference. You'll not be able to tell which one was shot with which lens. They both come out really well. Just want to talk about one more image, and that's this one here, also taken in Rip and Tour, I think of the same morning, actually. And this is probably my favorite of the bunch. I really like it. It's got lots of depth. Um, it's got lots of subtle lighting. It's got all the, the clouds in the sky. It's almost got just the perfect amount of, of coverage that I like to like to see. Now this is printed on, again, on Photospeed's PF Gloss 270 paper. But, so just in case you think I'm cheating and I'm only printing A4 images and you can't see enough detail, I have, because I like that image so much, made an A3 Plus print. And this is printed on uh, Photospeed's Platinum Cotton 305. It's so a matte paper and I think the image looks absolutely stunning. The lens has done a really good job of rendering this scene. I can see all the detail in the grasses, all the subtle changes in colour. It's getting to that time of year where things are starting to pick up a bit of brown, a bit of yellow, and that's really enhanced with the, the subtle side lighting, which obviously means there's no lens flare because I'm not shooting directly into the sun. A little bit of light there you can see on the rocks, and then that leads out into Haytor and this kind of uh, dark and heavy sky. It was kind of one of those mornings where the, the, the weather was quite variable, but I really like the final image, and this is what's important for me, is how it actually looks when you do a big print like this. Now, I've just told you how great I think that 24-200 is. I showed you the images, I showed you the print quality. So this 24-200, is it gonna replace my 24-70 F4? No, I mean, that's not why I bought it. I didn't buy it with a view to replacing my 24-70. The 24-70 stole has the edge in certain circumstances. It's a bit of a smaller lens, it's a bit of a lighter lens. It also handles flare a little bit better. So it will still be one of my go-to lenses for landscape photography when I'm taking out, you know, my 14 to 30, I'll take out my 24 to 70 as well. But I didn't buy this lens to cover 24 to 70. I bought this lens for me to cover the, the 70 to 200 range and that's what I want it for and that's going to do a really good job. You know, it's got a couple of niggles, the lens flare, you know, if I'm shooting into the sun, which isn't very often for me, is a bit of a bit of a niggle, but you know, things like that can sometimes be fixed in post-processing. You know, the, the lock switch, I did find myself not leaving it on for the click mechanism of the S-Line lenses. Uh, and also, you know, the new AF MF switch, I did kind of miss that, even though I've got the, the hot button set up to switch focusing mode. I just quite like doing the AF MF switch for switching on and off focus speaking. So the 2470 is still going to be in my kit bag, but this lens really is gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy with it, and it's gonna cover that 70 to, to 200 range. And also, you know, it's gonna be a great sort of, um, I hate to use the word travel lens, but you know, if I just wanna take out one lens when I'm wild camping, for example, and I really wanna cut down the weight of my kit bag, I'm still gonna be very happy, very content to take this lens out and shoot all my landscape photographs with it. Well, let's see if we can try and wrap up this video. Let's see if we can do some sort of uh, summary. I guess one of the questions you might have is, should I buy this lens? That's possibly a question I can't necessarily help you answer. 
everyone's shooting requirements are different. You might be shooting sports or birds in flight, and you know the, clearly this lens might not be the best choice for that. I only shoot landscapes. I also don't have access to lots of different gear. I haven't got different uh, Z-mount bodies. I don't have lots of lens to do comparisons with. I don't shoot test charts. Uh, it's not really my goal on this channel to do comprehensive gear reviews. All I want to do is kind of, if I get a better gear, share my experiences with you. But what I can say about the 24-200 is that the reasons I bought the lens um, and how it's performing, I know that this lens is going to deliver on what I want it to do. So that's that long focal length. And also sometimes when I want to use an all-in-one lens, this job, this lens is doing an excellent job and it's producing images of a quality that, are, that meets my requirements. And that's the most important thing. So hopefully by sharing my experience of using this lens with a, a landscape uh, in landscape photography, is uh, giving you a little bit more information um, about whether this lens is a good choice for you. I do hope you've enjoyed this video and more importantly, you found it useful. Please do let me know in the comments below. But I spent enough time indoors now talking about gear. I'm actually gonna go outside and take some landscape photographs. The weather forecast for Dartmoor is looking good tonight. So I'm gonna put that 24 to 200 in my bag, head out and capture some landscape photographs. But if you've got an extra few minutes, why not check out some more of my other videos? I'll include some links in the corner of the screen. But until the next one, I'll see you then.